November 1st, 2009, a day marked in NHL history. The 50th anniversary of the night that Jacques Plante first slipped on a mask in an NHL game. Forever changing the game itself. Welcome to 50 Years Behind the Mask. I'm Dan Pollard. Over the next hour, we'll take a look at the history of the mask and talk to one of the game's greatest historians. As well, we'll move to present day and find out how a mask is designed and created. We'll also talk about the improved mask safety and take a look back at some of the great masks over the years, culminating with our top 10. Before we do that, let's begin where it all started. The thought of a goaltender not wearing a mask is to think of someone committing hockey suicide. But less than 50 years ago, not one goaltender did. Injuries were commonplace, and the faces of most netminders were scarred for life. That all changed on a faithful night at Madison Square Garden. The Canadian Jacques Plante was injured on a shot by the Rangers' Andy Bathgate. It was a watershed moment in NHL history. The legendary journalist, Red Fisher, was there. It opened the cut from the corner of his mouth all the way up through his nostril. I'm trying to imagine that, the pain that he was going through. And I rushed down to the, to the dressing room. This was in, in Madison Square Garden. And there was Plant looking into the mirror and separating, you know, the cut, looking at it. And he said, pretty ugly, he said to me. I said, yeah, well, you had a good start, Shock. He lay down on the table, was stitched by the doctor, skated back to the room, put on his mask, came out, and when he came out with the mask, it was, you could feel and hear the buzz of the crowd. It was an incredible night. Plant had been wearing a mask during practices for months, but his head coach, Toe Blake, was dead set against it. On this occasion, however, Blake had no choice. No other goaltender was available, so he relented. Plant played well and won that night. Before the next game, Toe Blake just said to me, he's not going to wear the mask. And Plant says, said to me, if he doesn't, if I don't wear the mask, I'm not playing. And that was Jacques Plant. Any concerns of the mask negatively affecting Plant were dispelled when he would go on an unbeaten streak of 18 games. Just like that, the mask was here to stay. Jacques Plant was a genius that dared to be different. He changed the role of a goaltender in so many ways. He was the first to stop the puck behind the net. He was the first to handle it and headman the puck to teammates. But of all his enduring contributions to a sport he passionately cared about, we cite the goalie mask as the one we remember him best for. Goaltenders are the last line of defense, playing the most important position in all of sports. With pucks whizzing by their head and forwards crashing the net, they also play one of the most dangerous positions in all of sports. Jean Plant realized that, and he stood by his beliefs and slipped on his mask. Goaltenders, since that time, have him to thank. For more on the history of the mask, we talked to one of the leading hockey historians. I know we've already seen Jacques Plante's original mask, the pioneering mask, which was really uh, uh, quite a solid, uh, solid and obscured most of his face. But uh, uh, after only a handful of games, he switched to this uh, mask, which many call the pretzel style, and that was his signature mask. Uh, for many years and he went on to to great success with it and uh, uh, clearly it offered him uh, better protection uh, better vision and better ventilation and and and, and therefore dealt with the, the three concerns about masks when they were first introduced the other interesting mask in this case I think is this one by Gilles Meloche from 77 78 you can see in comparison to the the plant mask it does afford quite a bit greater protection it goes a lot higher on the forehead and protects the temples uh, it's, it's solid. It sits a little bit away from the goalie's face, again, allowing for ventilation. But really, it's the decoration that's so interesting. The full heraldry and the careful, real uh, kind of professional look to it uh, by the artist Greg Harrison uh, made it one of the significant masks of the late 70s. Gary Simmons of the California Seals wore this mask in the mid-70s. 
and it's significant not only just because it looks cool. Simmons' nickname was the Cobra, I think because of his quickness and, and all of that, and that's represented on the mask. And here we have a fully decorated mask that has nothing to do with the team. It's not even in the team colors. It doesn't have the team logo on it, but it's just a vivid mask, and it was very much was his signature. And it's interesting to compare it to this Grant Fuhr mask from 20 years later. Look at the difference between the two. We can see the goalie's face. We're, we're into the, the cage era. It's a much, much more protective. It stands away from the goalie, so it's got to be cooler. Uh, um, and there's been uh, a tremendous evolution. And here, here combined with the improved uh, uh, shoulder and chest protection that goalies were wearing by this point, now goalies could square up to the shooter, and if the puck nicked them on the mask, well, that wasn't that big a deal. Ken Dryden wore uh, this mask initially at Cornell University, where uh, uh, he became uh, an NCAA All-Star. Um, and indeed, he refers to it as, as his Cornell mask because he was one of those guys in the transition. He played his whole career up to that point without a mask, but NCAA rules required that goalies wore masks, period. So he put this one on, and he used it when he came to the NHL and had that uh, surprise coming from nowhere cup win in 71. He uh, used this with Team Canada against Russia in the Super Series in 72 um, and, and had a, you know, a great deal of success with it. Uh, and it is only after he took that year off, a sabbatical year, uh, there's a bit of a contract dispute, and he went back to law school, that he had the uh, red, white, and blue bullseye mask made that so many people remember him in. But this is the mask with which he began his career. Chico Resch wore this interesting mask from 74 to 1976 with the Islanders. And it's significant for a couple of reasons. It's uh, one of the very first masks that was fully decorated in a team's colors with a team's logo. And when you look at it closely, you can see that the surface of the mask is uneven and that it's been painted by hand. And it really has the feeling of being a piece of folk art. But within a couple of years, masks had another significant change. They still were a solid fiberglass piece. We were a, a big step away from the cutout and the, and the, metal, the metal cage that we know today. But these uh, uh, larger fiberglass masks had a, a prominent chin piece. It was almost like a cow catcher shape. Um, and these uh, uh, afforded mask decorators uh, a larger canvas on which to work. And, and perhaps the best known example of that is the mask that uh, uh, Gilles Graton wore for the New York Rangers in 76, 77. And it's the one that's painted into the fearsome face of a snarling cat. Now, everyone thought that it was a, it was a, a lion's face. Uh, uh, Graton was a, a character and notoriously superstitious, and astrologically he was a Leo, but he was quick to say that it, in fact it was a tiger, uh, a tiger's image, and that he got the idea from looking at National Geographic. Um, and, and he was a, a, eccentric of the highest order. He claimed he was a, a reincarnated soldier from the Spanish Inquisition. He, he, he believed his goaltending was influenced by the faces of the moon. Um, and, and, and he was known to hiss like a cat and growl at opposing players when they came in on, on goal. Um, and his mask reflected that. And in any collection, um, I haven't seen your final results of the 10 greatest masks, but I'm sure it's right near the top of the list. Plot paved the way for future netminders, but he wasn't the first goaltender to wear face protection in an NHL game. That distinction goes to Montreal Maroons netminder Clint Benedict, who donned a leather mask for a brief period in 1930. He didn't wear it long, though, as it hampered his vision.